Well, welcome here, everybody, to worship this morning on this glorious, glorious day. Well, I hope that your week has been good and that you are uh, in a comfortable spot where you might, where you are, get your morning beverage, and are ready to praise God. Uh, does anyone have any announcements before we get started? We're going to begin our worship, <clears throat> excuse me, our worship today with a line or two from a Let us begin our time of worship with the call to worship that is printed in the bulletin. This is adapted from Psalm 133, which is the um, psalm for the day. How wonderful and pleasant it is when kindred live together in harmony. It's like costly anointing oil flowing down the head and beard of the one who gave his life for many. It is like the dew in the morning, opening a fresh new day. The Lord gives us a blessing for a life that is whole. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Let us pray together. God of our life's journey, we gather together in fellowship and in support of each other as we worship you. We give you our thanks for this very special privilege of being part of a spiritual family that accepts us for who and what we are. We have each traveled a different road, but we gather for the same purpose, to honor, praise, and thank you for our common destination, being at home with you. Amen. All right, our first hymn is The Strife is Over. Thank you. 
please join me in the litany for Eastertide. We give you all thanks and praise, O God, for you have raised Jesus Christ from the dead, and by your grace we have life in his name. You sent your word of life into the world in your son, Jesus, shining your light into our darkness, that the sins of the world might be forgiven. Through his great grace, we are able to live in fellowship with you and in peace with one another, in one heart and mind. We praise you that you have not abandoned us to the living death of sin and despair, but that with Jesus Christ, you have lifted us up from the grave. Therefore, with our hearts lifted high, we offer you thanks and praise at all times through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is risen indeed. Alleluia. If you will join me in the prayer for illumination that is printed in the bulletin. Let me find that. Yeah, here we are. Okay. Let us pray. Light of the world, shine upon us and disperse any clouds that would distract us. As we hear your word, may we reflect the power of the resurrection in our life together. Amen. The scripture reading for today is the uh, epistle lesson for this particular Sunday. It is from 1 John, uh, starting at the beginning and reading through to the uh, first two verses of the second chapter. It looks like it might be really, really long, but it's not. Um, I will be reading from the New Living Translation. Uh, here we go. <clears throat> we proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. This one who is life itself was revealed to us and we have seen him. And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father, and then he was revealed to us. We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that you may fully share our joy. This is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you. God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. So we're lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. But if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim that we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. My dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins, and not only our sins, 
with the sins of all the world. This is the word of the Lord, and thanks be to God. The theme, the overall theme for the first, the, the first letter of John, yeah, for the first letter of John is, is in verse 5. This message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, God is light, and in God there is no darkness at all. I think we all kind of understand that on an intuitive level. If we sit in our, in our chairs and we look out over our, our yards or look out into the world, especially this morning with the sun shining, we intuit instinctively that light is everywhere. God is everywhere. Light and dark, those yin and yang, uh, this one, that one, on the other hand, on the other hand, that, that dual duality of life is the theme in the Gospel of John. If you've ever read through the Gospel of John, you will see that uh, exhibited throughout the entire gospel. As a matter of fact, the gospel of John is written so that it kind of starts, well, it starts with that big burst of light in the beginning was the word. Um, and, and then as Jesus starts interacting with people, uh, particularly I'm thinking of his interaction with Nicodemus in the dark, uh, Nicodemus himself embodies the traveling, the walking in the light that people who follow Jesus experience in their lives. Uh, there's an illumination or, or maybe a little bit of seeking, a little bit of illumination, uh, as, as one continues to live and move and have your being in God and Jesus, you become a little more filled with light. And until the end of the Gospel of John, where Nicodemus walks out into the daylight and offers to help take Jesus' body down off the cross. Now, this letter from John, this, the first letter of John, has a lot of uh, connections with the Gospel of John. The word or the word of life that was in or from the beginning, they both start out that way. Uh, a life is made manifest and testified to that is all over the Gospel of John, and you'll hear that a lot in the first, in the letter, uh, the first letter of John. The intimacy of God with the Son, Jesus Christ, and the proclamation of the word as light unquenched by darkness. Uh, the, the prologue that we read every year at Christmas, uh, the light came into the world and uh, darkness has not overcome it. The light we welcome at Christmas was with these people, the people who witnessed Jesus and was what we have heard, what we have seen with our own eyes, what we have beheld and touched with our own hands. The author of the, of the letter of, of, of John is trying to say to people who read this letter, both then and now, that they experience Jesus right there in the flesh. It happened, is what he's saying. And these verbs that he uses, what we have seen, what we have heard, what we've beheld, what we have touched, are all verbs in the perfect tense. Now that particular tense in Greek, we, we don't have the perfect tense in English. We have to kind of add words to make that happen. But in Greek, you just use the perfect tense and you conjugate a verb in such a way that people know, oh, we know what you're talking about. The perfect tense says that a past reality has happened and that past reality extends out into the future. So it's kind of like ripples in water that radiate outward from a central point that does not stop vibrating ever. This event is a defining moment for all life. And it's very important to the author of First John. Um, most scholars suggest that this letter that we're looking at today was written about a decade after the Gospel of John was written. And the Gospel of John was written around 80 or 90 AD. So there have been at least one generation, possibly two generations of believers who heard about Jesus 
and what he had done. It's getting a little further away from that central event. Um, and so this letter is being written to address a threat that was beginning to fracture that early church. And if, if you know, we're, we're always tempted to think the early church, oh, what an idyllic time. They all lived together and had everything in common and they loved and they served, but eh, not always. Some things popped up. And what, what this particular letter is addressing is people who have begun to think that Jesus didn't actually exist as a human being. Some of them have left the fellowship. They reject the claim that Jesus was fully human. They begin to understand him in terms of his divinity. And that takes place, precedence. And so they start putting him up there in the clouds and out there in the ether and deny the fact that he ever stood here in flesh and blood. What we have seen, what we have heard, what we have touched becomes very important to the author of John because it anchors Jesus in our world, even as he is worshiped as the anointed one. It would seem that some of the early church wanted to walk in the light and only the light. Audrey West, who is a New Testament professor at Moravian Theological Seminary in Minnesota, writing at Working Preachers, says this, Easter is behind us. The alleluias ring fresh in our ears. Joy of resurrection has been proclaimed through white lilies, soaring music, maybe even a few leftover chocolate Easter eggs. We have heard with our ears and seen with our eyes and touched with our hands this celebration of the empty tomb and a world forever changed by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. At the same time, however, our ears ring with the world's same old, same old. The joy of resurrection is flattened by political wrangling and the ongoing reality of home foreclosures and fruitless job searches, by despair and injustice and hearts broken open with jagged edges of grief. Is it not tempting to shut our eyes and our ears, to close our ha hands into fists of denial and to ignore those earthly realities? Don't we wish at least for a moment that the shining bright holiness of a resurrected Christ would blind our eyes to the stains of this fleshy, painful world. Now that we walk in the light of Jesus, can't we just ignore the sin around us and especially our own complicity in it? First John responds to these questions with the resounding, no, no. Yes, the light exists, and it is illuminating us, and it is showing us those places that need work. It matters what our eyes have seen, what our ears have heard, what our hands and fingers have touched, because a flesh and blood world needs a flesh and blood savior. Jesus doesn't save in an abstract way. He saves us in our actual bodies. This is good news. This is great news, especially if our bodies are dwelling in a land of deep darkness. Again, going back to Christmas, the prophet Isaiah sings that the light has dawned on the people living in, de in deep darkness and that these people are blessed and he urges these people to who, who, who live, who sit in this deep darkness, who dwell in this darkness, to trust and rely on God to lead them out of it, rather than relying on the lights of their own making. <clears throat> Excuse me. The author of this letter says the same thing to those who think they've got this whole resurre resurrection thing figured out. Oh, resurrection, great. Jesus has paved the way to heaven. So we no longer need to worry about hell or earth. No, that's not true. 
if we think that is what resurrection is all about, just getting into heaven, then we're still in the dark. To grope around in the darkness of the resurrection, to see the dark places illuminated by that light means we need to confess. Confess we got it wrong. Confess how we've missed the mark. Confess the reality of our human nature that thinks, ah, we got it pegged. We don't need to worry about that anymore. When in reality, we need to think about it all the time. To confess sin is to publicly and specifically acknowledge our need of God. To deny the reality of sin is to deny God's saving action in Christ and the love of God that sent him to the world in the first place. To confess our sin, we confess our sin because we know God's nature is love and forgiveness. We hear, see, touch God's love and God's forgiveness in the person of Jesus and in one another. Now, that's not always easy <clears throat> because we humans have really long memories, especially long memories if we feel in any way that our rights have been trampled. It's like this. Two traveling monks came across a young woman who was very angry and she was waiting to be uh, helped out of her sedan chair. It had rained and there was mud everywhere. And uh, for whatever reason, the people who were supposed to help her out were not doing their job fast enough. So the, the younger monks saw this angry woman, thought, I'm not getting involved with that, and continued to walk on by. The older monk went over to her, offered her his back, helped her get her silken robes up around uh, so that they wouldn't drag through the mud, put her on his back, carried her across the muddiness and set her down uh, where it was dry. Without even thanking him, she turned her nose up and walked away. No thank you. So the young monk and the older monk continued on their, their journey and the younger monk was very preoccupied. And then several hours later, Unable to hold his silence, he speaks out to the older monk and he says, that woman back there was very selfish and rude, but you picked her up on your back and carried her. And then she didn't even thank you. The older monk looked at the younger monk and replied, I set that woman down hours ago. Why are you still carrying her? This is what confession does for us. It may be unpleasant. We may have to deal with situations that are not to our liking, but when we confess, see the dark places that need work, give them to God, we can set them down and we're not burdened by them. Jesus didn't give his life for us to continue living our old lives of sin and lies. We simply must face up to wrongdoing, not deny it. And what is more, we need to acknowledge it openly. Now, for some of us, that's easy. We've had a lifetime experience of doing it in our worship settings. Others of us, eh, maybe not quite as easy. And the idea of doing it as a body of believers is probably key because a body of believers confessing a common sin, a common failing, means that we as a group are going to support one another in doing better. What is knowing God leads to fellowship in God, to trust in God, and being able to love God as we see God at work in one another's lives. So this idea of confessing sin uh, seems to suggest that there is a set of values that we need to live up to. And as we look around our world, we might be thinking that the values of the world seem kind of backward. Many of us probably have a very growing sense or have known for a very long time that the values in our culture 
are really not all that valuable at all. The morality we see in our systems, our leaders, the people around us, not so moral. And it's tempting to say, I'm out of here. I don't want to be associated with any of that anymore. And if that's where you are, well, there might be a reason to be hopeful. Because when we identify a way of life we don't want, we can choose something different. We can start walking in the light. Richard Rohr, who is a theologian in uh, New Mexico, says, what I let God see and accept in me also becomes what I can then see and accept in myself, in my friends, and in everything else. He calls this radical grace. He goes on and says, this is why it is crucial to allow God and at least one other trusted person to see us in our imperfection and even our nakedness as we are, rather than as we would ideally wish to be. It is also why we must give others the same experience of being looked upon in their imperfection. Otherwise, they will never know the essential and transformative mystery of grace. Such an utterly free and gratuitous love is the only love that validates, transforms, and changes us at the deepest levels of consciousness. It is what we all desire and what we were created for. Once we allow it for ourselves, we will almost naturally become a conduit of the same for others. In fact, nothing else will attract us anymore or even make much sense. We have been given the gift, the opportunity in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to walk every day in his light. The way the sun is shining right now, that could be life for us always. Now, sometimes people try to solve problems using the same tools the same way over and over and over again and expect different results. God gives us the gift of new life, but we try to fit that new life back into our old way of being and doing. The resurrection, walking in the life, means different. First John insists that the real flesh and blood presence of Jesus in this world matters. His suffering and dying as a human being shows us that God is not distant or detached from our existence, but enters fully into our human reality. It assures us that his life-giving power conquers sin, suffering, death, and that our entire self will be redeemed. Today, as you enjoy this light, consider that light to be in you, to be for you, to be what gives you light that you can then use to illuminate others. Thanks be to God for the gift we have been given in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Alleluia and amen. Our second hymn is number 154. Thank you. 
Let us pray. God of all, God of each of us, God of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you come into our midst with resurrection power to free us from anything that enslaves us those things that keep us from the fullness of life that you desire for all of your children and for the earth itself. Help us be open to your presence in our lives, even if it means facing difficult circumstances that bind us and keep us from living fully. We pray for your church amid the conflicted times in which we live that those who call you Lord would serve you faithfully and that your places of worship will be places where wounds are touched, attended to, released, liberated, and redeemed. We pray for the people, your people, in every place in the world, Almighty God, that we may seek common good and work for justice and peace for all people and not just few. For all those who hunger and thirst, we pray they may be filled with good things. For those whose rights have been abused or rejected or denied, Give us the strength and the courage to stand in solidarity with them and be a witness to justice so they may be restored. And we pray for those whose lives have been torn and traumatized by violence. May we be agents of your love to each of these, your children. Show us how we might do that. God of the nations, we pray for elected officials around our globe, for people in positions of power. We pray that you will help them resist greed, prideful ambition, and partisan gain, so that they may serve the welfare of all of their people, especially the least of these in our midst. Again, show us how we might keep our leaders accountable. We trust that you, almighty God, are a God of salvation and wholeness. And we come to you as people who are continuing to live in an era of pandemic. We thank you for the strides that have been made so far, that so many of our particular population have been vaccinated and are continuing to be vaccinated. We thank you that the floodgates have opened and we've been able to find ways of overcoming a virus that has kept us apart. We pray for those who were working to inoculate us and we pray for those who were still holding back that you may give them 
better information and a better understanding of what it means to live as a community. We pray that you will continue to be with weary healthcare workers. We pray that you will continue to be with those who are sick and everyone who has lost a loved one. Be near to those on whose behalf we call upon you. Those who are facing sorrow over the loss of loved ones, either because of the virus or other, other reasons. We pray that you will continue to be with those who are ill. We pray that you will be with those who have been injured or who are post-surgery. And we pray that you will be with people we know who are struggling with life and the coming of life and the letting go of life. Fulfill our longings for wholeness, healing, resurrected life. Hear and answer all those who cry out to you and hear these, the prayers of our hearts. Steadfast God, preserve us in your love, that we might speak your praise and bless you forever. In the name of the Holy One, the risen Christ, who taught his disciples to say this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God is at work in the world. We trust in God, and together we work for peace and justice through God's Spirit as we offer our tithes and our gifts. Let us rejoice in our God-given opportunity to share in God's work. And friends, as I say every week, find a way to give. It may be something big. It may be something small. But it is giving of yourself, of what you have, of who you are. Let us give thanks to God for the giving opportunities that we have had and will have and dedicate them to God by singing together the doxology and then saying the prayer of dedication. The doxology. Let us pray. In these gifts, O God, we acclaim you as our Lord. 
May they be useful to you in bringing your kingdom into full flower through the ministries of your church. We pray to honor Christ's name. Amen. Our final hymn is number 119. And now, my friends, go out into this world as you are able in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return to one evil for evil, but strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. He gives you to do those things and so very much more. And now may the love of the God who created you, the peace of the God who redeemed you, and the strength of the God who sustains you be with you now, this day, and always. Go with God, my friends. Go in peace. Amen. Please greet one another with the words of the ancient church. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And, and also with you. Yeah.